If you open up a Catholic Bible, you will find that they have 73 books in their Bible. Now with that being said, reason number one why Protestants reject the Apocrypha is, and this is probably the strongest one, is that there are some inconsistencies in the Apocrypha. The first inconsistency that I want to point out is this idea that we can pray for the dead. And the idea here is that if you have a loved one who has died and you're not sure if they've gone to heaven or to hell, you, the living person, can still pray for that person and your prayers can help save them. Now, Catholics will get this idea of prayers for the dead from a book found in the Apocrypha, found in their Bible, called uh, 2 Maccabees, chapter 12, uh, verses 39 through 46. So, so I, I want to read that, and I want you to, to explain, I want to explain exactly where they get this doctrine from. It says here, on the next day, as by that time it has become necessary, Judas and his men went to take up the bodies of the fallen and to bring them back to lie with their kinsmen in the sepulchers of their fathers. There were some men that were killed in battle and Judas and his men go out and try to recover the bodies so that they could bury them in the graves next to their fathers. So, Continuing on, verse 40, it says, Then under the tunic of every one of the dead they found sacred tokens of the idols of Jamnia, which the law forbids the Jews to wear. So what happens now? They go try to recover these bodies, but what they find is that in the tunics or in the jackets of these people, there are some idols that they have taken that they shouldn't have taken. In other words, they're guilty of idol worship of this. And it became clear to all that this was why the men had fallen. So they all blessed the ways of the Lord, the righteous judge who reveals the things that are hidden. Now here it is. I want you to pay close attention to this. And they turned to prayer, beseeching that the sin which has had been committed might be wholly blotted out. So notice here that Judas and his men started praying on behalf of their deceased loved ones in hopes that, and in believing that, their prayers would somehow blot out the sins of these men who they believe fell because they were involved in idol worship. Here that Judas and his men started praying on behalf of their deceased loved ones. What is Jesus teaching here? Whenever you die, your fate, my friend, is secure. There are no second chances. There is nothing that loved ones can do. There's nothing that loved ones can do to somehow save you or promote you into eternal bliss. Inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment. That's it. You die, and after Lord, that, you all you the praises and the honor to Yahweh Bahashem, Yahweh Shai Bahashem, Kwadash, and double honors to the apostles and the elders of Great Millstone. Shalom also to you, other brethren, you followers of the truth. Shalom to the elect. Anyway, I was, I'm going to go in this video. Uh, I seen it a while ago. And a um, brother uh, from the other camp sent me this video. And I said, well, let me look at it again. Because <laughs> I wasn't going to mess with it. But um, this video is by this guy, The Beat by Alan Parr, which I've done several videos on him, you know, on a few videos on this guy. Uh, but uh, what I will say is that the Bible is not an easy book to understand for those who it wasn't given to. Now, Revelation 22 I'll quote some and I'll try to get through it, you know, to make a shorter lesson. Um, you know, the scripture says, if any man take away from this book, he should be, you know, have his part taken out of the book of life, which we know is the rulers of darkness. These, uh, he went into the Protestants, 
And they was nothing but reformationists, you know. You had the Bible Destruction Group. You had reformationists. Uh, you can look all this history up. I'm not going to go back and forth about it. John Calvin and um, they had a beef with the Roman Catholic Church and they, you know, um, they reformed. The reformationists reformed the Bible, so to speak. But then you had a man named um, uh, Canon and then you had Eusebius, you know, where you had the Old Testament actually taken out of the Bible in general because they figured it was um, too, uh, the Old Testament was too graphic. And this is why today you see most of these Christians in the church, they'll read out of the New Testament and read the love, good, goody parts of the Bible. They kind of stay away from the Old Testament unless it has something to do with something great, you know, but they won't go into the Israelites, Joshua and, um, they also went into, I'll, I'll try to get it, tie it all in, um, with the, um, second, uh, Maccabees, um, and all the history that's in the, uh, Apocrypha in general. So if they wanted to say, okay, they wanted to take a certain book out, but there's a, a lot of our history is in the Apocrypha. So, um, I'll get into that too. Okay. But, um. You had the Old Testament taken out at once upon a time. You had the Apocrypha taken out, right? You even had the New Testament taken out, which you, that's this is why you have Old Testament Israelites who don't practice the New Testament. So you had various books taken out, not only just the Apocrypha, but the Old Testament, and then you had the New Testament taken out, and you had the Apocrypha taken out in various other scrolls. So... um. Before 1670 or so, so, uh, so forth, all the Bibles, all the books had the Apocrypha in it, right? It wasn't till about the 1700s, uh, it was maybe 1600s around that era that they took all the, um, the books out. I mean, the Apocrypha out. Now, you had several Bibles. You had the Great Bible of 1539, right? Right? Uh, you had the, the Geneva Bible of uh, 1599. You had the King James of 1611. You had the Tyndale Bible of the 1300s, which all had the Apocrypha in it. You try to pull it up, it won't show it, but it was in there. You had uh, um, the Wycliffe Bible of 1382. So you mean to tell me the Heavenly Father put all these books you know, made all these books and when it was put together, it wasn't meant to be there because you got to understand it was books and they all conformed together and made the, um, the book of records. That's what Biblios means. Anyway, let's go into the Maccabees real quick. Second Maccabees, right? Uh, just to jump on that real quick. I'm going to just get to the point two and 40. Now, under the coats of every one that was slain, they found things consecr consecrated to the idols of the Jamnites. Now, if you go into the history, and even in the book of Joshua, you had a man named Achan and his family, and you had men in the past who would steal, um, take the idols and worship the idols, and they would be killed for it. So it was, it was against our practice, right? Anyway, it says, which is forbidden the Jews by, by the law. Then every man saw that this was the cause wherefore they were slain, right? For as the Israelites, following other gods, um, dealing with the other gods' idols, right? So it goes on to say, all men, therefore praising the Lord, the righteous judge, who had opened the things that were hid, betook themselves unto prayer and besought him, that the sin committed might wholly be put out of remembrance. Remembrance, Besides, that noble Judas exhorted the people to keep themselves from sin, for as much as they saw before their eyes the things that came to pass for the sins of those that were slain. Right? So we're going to get to that point. And when he had made a gathering throughout the company of the son of some of 2,000 uh, drachms of silver, drachms of silver, he sent it to Jerusalem uh, to, uh, to offer for a sin, right? Offering a sin offering, doing therein very well and honestly in that he was mindful of the resurrection, 
right? For it had been not hoped that they that were slain should have risen again, right? See, for it had not hoped that they that were slain should be risen again. It had been superfluous and vain to pray for the dead. This is what it say. It had been superfluous and vain to pray for the dead. Let's look up superfluous. So, you know, these guys are just making it up as they go along. Nobody said that we're supposed to pray for the dead. But I'll get to the point of why he said that. Um, beyond what is needed, not necessary. Exceeding what is sufficient. So that's what superfuscious mean. Right? So it says, let me go back. It had been superfuscious and vain to pray for the dead. So basically not needed to pray for the dead. And it says, and also in that he perceived that there was great favor laid up for those that died godly, right? It was an holy and good thought whereupon he made a reconciliation for the dead, right? That they might be delivered from sin. Now, you, the whole point is that our people, you know, when when he sent the offer, a sin offering was for the fact that, um, when we went off as as even as these people had went off that the lord would not punish us all right the lord may not punish us all and then there was a well-known thing of reincarnation and that's what this guy doesn't understand there's a well-known thing of reincarnation right the scripture says fear not what one could do to the body but what could one could do to the soul so he brings up he, he brings up hebrews where it says a man is appointed once to die, which is true. But that doesn't mean he doesn't come back. Anyway, wherefore, whereupon he made a reconciliation for the dead that they might be delivered from sin. Okay? So now we're going to go into Matthew. This is a section called Whose Son is, is the Christ? Yahweh. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Yahweh asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ whose son is he right now everybody should know that right they say unto him, to, unto him the son of David which we know he came through Joseph as well but why do they say the son of David Solomon was the son of David goes on to say he saith unto them how then doth David in the spirit call him Lord so they're saying wait a minute if he's the son David how does David call Solomon Lord right as in and he's even of now you know you know that david would be under yahweh right then the lord said unto my lord right and the lord with a capital lies said unto my lord sit thou on my right hand till i make thine enemies thy footstool if david then call him lord how is he his son right and no man was able to answer him a word, neither does any man from that day forth ask any more questions. So if David call him Lord, then how is he his son? These, this is what you call reincarnation, right? Want further proof? Let's go to Matthew 1. I mean, we can go, there's several scriptures on that. It says, the book of generations of Jesus Christ, Yahweh Shah, the son of David, the son of Abraham, Right? How's Yahweh the son of David and the son of Abraham? Who was the son of Abraham? Isaac. And in various others, uh, um, Ishmael, but we're going into the lineage of David. Abraham begot Isaac, right? And it just said it here the son of Abraham, Isaac, and Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob, Judas, his brethren. Uh, it goes on down to say, and Jesse begot David the king, and David the king begot Solomon. Okay? So, this is why we go up here, and it says, the book of generations of Yahweh, the son of David, and the son of Abraham. It's really that simple. But, we can clearly see that these guys, um, they don't understand the Bible. You know, we were never meant, it wasn't even a custom for us to pray to the dead. What happened here in this situation is there was an offering made for the sins, right? And um, 
you know, when we went off as a people, you know, to fear the Lord, you know, would punish us. And we get we would get punished in total, you know, as a nation. And you don't want the fear of the Lord to punish you as a nation. There was well known history, and they knew that there was times when the Lord was with us, and then there was time there was times when the Lord wasn't with us. So these were just saying of things that they done, but it doesn't make it righteous to pray for the dead. It's a story. Right? Let's go into first Maccabees. And it says, Where in entered into Egypt with a great multitude with chariots and elephants and horsemen and the great navy and made war against Ptolemy king of Egypt but Ptolemy was afraid of him talking about Antiochus but let me go up now when the king was established before Antiochus he thought to reign over Egypt okay and that he might have dominion over the two realms right so this was a nation uh, the same nation against another nation I meant the same nation right they were the same people one you know amongst one another it says wherefore he entered into egypt with a great multitude with chariots and elephants and horsemen and a great navy and made war against ptolemy king of egypt but ptolemy was afraid of him and fled and were wounded to death now when you go into maccabees the whole breakdown of maccabees going into uh what happened to us the temple being sacked and the hell we took and how we became Hellenized, the beginning of the Hellenization of the Israelites, right? And you even had other nations that was formed Hellenized as well. You had the Egyptians who also practiced the Greek culture, right? But this book is about the Israelites, right? Who, where we caught the hell. So, you know, that's all I wanted to talk about, the fact that there's many books, uh, the books of the Bible that was taken out, right, on, on different occasions. So this was nothing new to have the Apocrypha taken out. It wasn't nothing new. Um, it's just that these Jakes here has grown up on um, the regular Bible and hasn't saw anything else greater, you know, uh, we were added as far as wasn't really added. It was taken away. So when you grow up in a Christian church and that's all you know, then that's what you're stuck with. Hell, they not even, they don't even understand the original Bible, so let alone the KJV. But these uh, Protestants were noth nothing more than the same people who forced us. Um, in fact, they didn't even want the book of James and I believe Hebrews in the Bible. They said that wasn't canonized. So there were several books even in the New Testament. And you got to remember the whole New Testament was taken out at once upon a time. Right? This is what it was. But then you, you know, again, you had these uh, these uh, Protestants who were, um, uh, I read an article that said the Protestants today feel that police was justified in killing so-called black people. You know, I'm not going to read the whole article, but I, just wanted to bring that up. They always were formed on racism. And they knew we was the Israelites. So they took they didn't want us to read the scriptures that talk about we fled to a land that we didn't know. Or uh as um second Ezra six and fifty four about um from Adam come we all, but the Lord has chose the Israelites and counted the other nations as spittle. You know? That was all about taking the hardships out of the Bible. So when they took the Apocrypha out, they uh, took the Old Testament out, and you had a New Testament Bible. And then you had, you know, the other ones who figured the New Testament, they didn't believe in the Savior, so they took the New Testament out of the Bible. So that's what that was all about. So that was nothing new. Anyway, hope this lesson was edifying. That's all I have on that. Shalom.